Hello guys, today I'm going to analyze the new mountain rig from DMR Bikes, the SLED. The DMR SLED uses a two-link suspension design where the first link pivots around the bottom bracket. So let's see how does this system works. To start our analysis, we need to find the magic point, the instant center, also known as the virtual pivot. So, in this case, the, the rear triangle is connected to the main frame by the, the two links and therefore the intersection lines from the two links give you the instant center point. Please keep in mind that we are at the sack position, ok? 30% sack position. Now that we got the instant center, we are going to look for the anti-rise. To determine the anti-rise, we need to cross a line between the contact point of the rear tire passing through the instant center. And as you can see, in this bike, the anti-rise is around 80%, which is a normal value for a dual-link suspension system. Therefore, an anti-rise of 80% will mean that the brake caliper will rotate a little bit around the disc when the suspension cycles through its travel. As you can see here, the brake caliper rotates a little bit around the disc during suspension travel. This means that when you apply the brakes, the rear brake, the, the forces from the rear brake try to squat a little bit the suspension. However, this, this slightly squats induced by the rear braking also has some advantages. For instance, when you apply the brakes, in particular when you apply the rear brake, uh, due to inertia, your weight uh, tends to move forward, okay? And this causes some uh, unloading of the suspension and, and the suspension will rise a little bit. Therefore, with an anti-rise of 100%, the squat forces coming from the brake will cancel out the, the, the rise forces due to the inertia uh, of the rider. And therefore, with an anti-rise of 100%, when you apply the rear brakes, the geometry of the bike is preserved and it does not change. Okay, so to conclude, uh, in very low anti-rises, the brake does not affect the suspension, but it also uh, does not preserve the geometry when you are braking. Okay, so in the case of the sled, you got an anti-rise of 80%, so the bike uh, preserves quite well the, the geometry when you apply the, the rear brake. Good. So now moving on to a more important parameter, the anti-squat, uh, which determines the pedaling efficiency of the bike. So this is an enduro bike, so pedaling is important in an enduro bike. So as you know, when you pedal, uh, the suspension has the tendency to squat, to compress, okay? And this causes pedal bob. What the anti-squat does basically is to pull down the rear triangle, okay? So the chain, when you apply chain tension, you are pulling down, extending the rear triangle, okay? So when the anti-squat forces match the squat forces, you cancel out the pedal bob and the suspension does not compress when you are pedaling. Okay, so let's see what is the anti-squat of this bike. To determine the anti-squat of the DMR sled, you need to cross a line between the axle and the eastern center, the swing arm line, and then you need to check where this line crosses the chain line. As you can see, the swing arm line crosses the chain line at the top of the chain ring. And if you remember my previous video, this is the best place where this crossing can happen. Why? Because not only this cross means that your bike will have an anti-squat almost 100%, so great pedaling efficiency, but it also means that your bike will always have an anti-squat around 100% independently of the rear cog that you are using. Okay, so this bike has a very good pedaling efficiency for our rear cogs on a 32 uh, chain ring. Now, uh, on this graph here, uh, this represents and this shows how the anti-squat changes along the travel in this bike. And each line corresponds to a different cog on the cassette. So as you can see, the, the profile, the anti-squat profile of this bike is pretty interesting and it is not a very common profile and as you can see, it's an inverted U-shape. Okay, so this means that on the pedaling zone, you got a pretty good anti-squat 
in this zone, okay, 100% as we saw previously. And uh, on the non-pedaling zone, like this zone here and this zone here, uh, the anti-squats drop to a lower values, and therefore this results in, um, in a less chain grow, in a less total chain grow on the bike, and it also helps to reduce the pedal kickback. So it's an interesting anti-squat profile that keeps down the, the chain grow and the pedal kickback. By talking on chain grow, uh, if you look to the difference between this, this distance at the top out and bottom out, you can see that the chain growth is about 24 millimeters, which is a, which is a good value and is probably a bit slightly lower than, than the average for an, an enduro bike. Conversely, the, the pedal kickback is, is under normal values and probably a bit lower than, than the average for an enduro bike. Good, so now we are going to see the progressivity, the leverage ratio. Uh, as you can see, the, the leverage ratio of this bike has a pretty interesting shape. So you got here a degressive zone, okay, or, or a regressive zone under sag. Okay, the sag point is about this, this region here, the sag. So you got here a degressive zone under sag and then a progressive zone after sag. This degressive zone here will not affect uh, almost nothing the final result because it only occurs at the beginning of the travel. Okay, so this graph here represents the force required to compress the suspension along the travel. And as you can see, the sled frame provides uh, more 21% of progressivity when compared to a fully linear bike. Also, as you can see, there is no difference between the sled and the linear bike at the beginning of the travel. So as I said previously, that degressive zone of the leverage ratio will not influence almost nothing the final result. Now, since this bike runs a Debonair air shock, I also put here the, the final result for the Debonair shock, the brown lines. Okay, so this line here is without any uh, spacers and this one is with full spacers. Since the, the frame progressivity is not very high, for the most aggressive riders, you probably will need uh, to put full spacers on your Debonair. If you do so, you end up with a final progressivity around 50%, which I think is a quite good value. Going back to our famous progressivity table, where it compares just the progressivity of the frame, not the shock, just of the frame, we can see that the DMR sled has an average progressivity for an enduro bike. So to conclude, the pedaling efficiency of the sled is pretty good and given the anti-squat profile of this bike, the pedal kickback and the chain grow are kept on normal levels or probably a bit better than normal levels. Regarding the braking, the geometry is quite well preserved under braking, with anti-rises around 80%, which are a quite common value for a dual-link suspension system. Finally, the bike has a normal progressivity for an enduro bike, which I think that will fit many riders out there. But if you are an aggressive rider and you like to do jumps and drops, uh, it's a good idea to add some, some spacers on your shock. And if you do so, you will end up with a final progressivity of 50%, which is a, a pretty interesting value. So that's it, guys. I hope that you liked the video and the analysis. And see you next time. Bye!